Good morning and welcome to Pleasant Street United Methodist Church. To all of you here today and to those of you joining us from home. Uh, Pleasant Street and St. Luke's Men's Group will meet on Tuesday morning by Zoom at 6 a.m. You are invited to take part in a book study beginning on Wednesday on the Wednesday after Labor Day of Reclaiming Joy Together, which tells the story of the respite ministry and offers guidance to begin a similar work here. For details, please speak with Sally Perkins. The studies will be at the Hope Center at 8 a.m. and also through Zoom. You are invited to Sabbath services, which are now in person at the Hope Center, where we meet each Saturday at 4 p.m. for worship, communion, and small group discussion, also through Zoom. Offerings and pledges can be sent by check to 8 Pleasant Street, Salem, New Hampshire, or placed in the offering plate. And are there any other announcements at this time? Yes, Sally. <laughs> is there or isn't there a trustees meeting tomorrow? No? I had it on my schedule for tomorrow. I had it as well. Yeah. Okay. Bernie? <laughs> <laughs> All right. There is a trustees meeting tomorrow evening, call hall at uh, 7 p.m. All right. Thank you. We'll go to the opening prayer. God of all creation, thank you that you are. Thank you for existing. Thank you for the beauty of your word, the humility of your ways, and providing us to learn with you as you patiently guide us to the bedrock of truth. Thank you that even though everything around us change, con changes continually and words seem cheap, you remain true. May your words speak to us, through us, through actions that ring with your clarity, justice, and strength. May your will be done today and every day. We come to you through Christ. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. O Lord, who may abide in your tent, who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our opening hymn is Change My Heart, O God, from the Faith We Sing, number 2152.
Good morning. Welcome to worship at United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Ben. Welcome to all joining us online. How are you all today? Great. <laughs> I welcome you to share joys and concerns. Sally. Sally's requesting prayers. She spoke recently with Barbara Larson, um, who has been transitioning to receive live-in help. So as she's requesting prayers for her and Alan through this time of transition. Thank you, Sally. Yes, Pat. Pat is requesting prayers for teachers and students heading back to school in the coming days now, or some have already returned. Um, tough year ahead, and prayers for them on that journey. Bernie, did I see your hand before? Same concern that Salem students come back this week. Bernie requesting prayers for the same thing, yeah. Gail. Gail is requesting prayers for Marge Jackson, who will be having an additional surgery on September 3rd. Uh, Marge recently fell and has been in the hospital um, recovering from surgery. Um, also, please lift up Gail's cousin, who will be undergoing surgery as well for an aortic aneurysm. So prayers, please, for uh, each of those folks. Donna. Yes, Diane. Diane is sharing the joy uh, of ice cream. <laughs> uh, she and other ladies from uh, here, Pleasant Street and St. Luke's, enjoyed uh, an ice cream social this past Friday that Milka helped to organize. Um, and also prayers for her colleague Erica, who um, has a procedure coming up, which uh, Diane does believe is cancer related, but prayers for the best outcome with that. Yes, Norma. Oh. <laughs> Norma is sharing the joy that her granddaughter, Brooke Johnson, is turning 22 today. Happy birthday. Yes.
Loretta is requesting prayers for the families of soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan and um, prayers also for those looking to escape that situation. It's uh, really a tough situation right now. We'll keep them in prayer. Let's enter into our time of prayer with our prayer hymn, O Lord, Hear My Prayer. Lord God, as we gather in this time of prayer, of worship, of remembrance of your word, celebration of your word, His hope and healing. Salvation and grace. We give thanks. Thank you, God, that you speak through stillness. That as we quiet our minds and still our hearts, There's a quality of peace and presence which transcends all understanding. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts. that foundation of trust. That we bring about actions in keeping with your will. Father, with 
gratitude at the privilege to bring before you our brothers and sisters We lift up Barbara and Alan in their transition, Lord, to receive live-in care. Just bring uncertainties. questions, help them to find your answers and the answer in you. We left up teachers and students anticipating another year under and challenges that uh, the pandemic has presented that it brings. Once again, may the questions ever changing nature of the response a call to humbly receive that which is eternal. You, Lord, to rest in the constancy of your grace. Father God, we lift up Marge, anticipating an additional surgery. Thank you for the example she gives. Of solid trust in you and hopefulness, humor. Strengthen her through her recovery and ease her mind. in the anticipation of more interventions. Father, we lift up Donna. Send word to her of the constant hope, the strength to be found in your name. Guide the hands of surgeons and other caregivers attending to her concerns, Lord. Father, we lift up the families of soldiers, so many who have lost loved ones.
in the midst of the chaos in Afghanistan and violence. May your perfect peace reign in hearts and minds. Wisdom to guide responses, Lord. hospitality and welcome to refugees. Lord God, we lift up Erica, anticipating a procedure. And we thank you, God, for simple joys of ice cream, celebration of life and birthdays, bless Brooke. Here we are, God. Strengthen us, your people, who have heard your word. That we would act on it with genuine hearts and the strength of hope to be found in you. It is with hope, Lord, that we lift up the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. How many of you recall during your, maybe at school, maybe Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, taking a little seedling and putting it in a plastic cup? <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> Can you describe what you felt as you carried out that exercise? Was it... Um, was it hope that you felt when you planted that seed? Was it a bit of joy when you saw the first leaves? 
Diane? Excitement. Excitement. Yeah. yeah. What else was required to keep that plant going? Patience. Patience, yeah. <laughs> Water. Sun, yeah. And soil. <laughs> so it's a process, right? Today we're going to be exploring from the book of James uh, what it is to be doers of the word. And the word is kind of like that seed. It's, it's a fragile tender growth that requires care, requires attention, requires watering, requires the right conditions of sunlight and attention. So as we, um, as we reflect on God's word, that word of salvation that has been engrafted, that has been implanted in our hearts, May we be attentive, just like we were when we watered that little seedling and saw it grow into something beautiful. Let's have a quick prayer. God, we thank you for your implanted word of grace in our hearts. Let us be attentive in our tending of your word. to grow in keeping with your ways. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. A lot rise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Our second reading today is from James 1, verses 17 through 27. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word, and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves, and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 through 15, 21 through 23. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it, 
and there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. Added as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human, human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that can, can come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly, all these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. May God add his blessings to these readings. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today's message is called Being Doers of the Word. When my wife and I first looked at the house where we used to live in central Massachusetts to possibly purchase, I wanted to run away. <laughs> Structurally and in other ways, it was sound, but it needed a lot of work. There was a 12-foot retaining wall and stairway that looked close to falling down in the front yard. It needed a new septic system, and it had a huge hilly yard that would take hours to mow. But one of the features that we came to know very well in the following months, after we did end up purchasing it with the help of a bank, was a large overgrown section that extended from the top of the road, down the side, and wrapped around the back. This section was a tangle of sharp wires, smack trees, and assorted, sometimes bizarre heaps of garbage that the owner, the previous owner, had left behind. We had moved to the home in October of 2019 with an aim to launch a new multi-ethnic ministry there in Southbridge among the Hispanics and Latinos of the town. In March of 2020, we, like all of you, received news that we would be spending an unforeseen amount of time at home. We looked at the yard, <laughs> looked at one another, <laughs> took a deep breath, and knew it was time to clean up the tangle of briars, sumac trees, and bizarre heaps of garbage that the previous owner had left behind. I began the work with a bow saw <laughs> until the next door neighbor had a grasp of what we setting out to do, had pity on me and lent me a power sawzall and a few other tools. Over the following weeks, we hacked, scraped, and dragged more tangles of brush and briars away from that ugly patch of land than I care to remember. And each day, we had large fires in the back to burn it all away. It was hard work, and the whole family got involved. In time, I came to see it as representing a practice I'll share more about shortly. Today, we begin an exploration in the short letter of James from the New Testament. Tradition holds that James was the half-brother of Jesus. In Hebrew, his name is Yaakov. In Greek, Yaakos, which we often hear rendered as Jacob. We learn of his story in the early church from the books of Acts in Paul's letter to the great Galatians. After Peter had left Jerusalem to start other churches, it was James, or Jacob, who remained in Jerusalem to lead the church there. The Jerusalem church was composed mainly of Messianic Jews, or Christian Jews, and theirs was the very first community of believers. They lived in a time of famine and endured persecution 
under the same religious political powers that had put Jesus to death. James was known as a peacemaker who led the Jerusalem church for some 20 years with wisdom and courage until he was ultimately murdered. The people who James is writing to are a community under threat, which never was part of the dominant culture. James is concerned with how to live out the gospel in a volatile or dangerous environment. He's very concerned for the poor and very concerned about the church falling into the heap, into the trap of showing favoritism to the wealthy. James's letter is different from other letters of the New Testament in that it is less concerned with the specific situations and struggles within the communities of Christians as Paul's letters often are as much as being a summary of James's sage wisdom for any and every community of Jesus' followers. It is addressed in a general way to Jewish, Jewish believers scattered throughout the nations, which, to which they are described as fleeing after the stoning of Stephen. James's letter is clearly influenced by the teachings of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and also echoes the first nine chapters of the book of Proverbs from the Old Testament. James explores the practical application of Jesus' teachings, especially the corollary to the greatest commandment. Do you remember the greatest commandment? You got it. Hear, O Israel. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And the corollary word in the chapter 2 of James, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This verse provides the lens for reading the book of James, hearing its heartbeat, and applying its teachings. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, fulfilling the law through love for the sake of your neighbor. A guiding point for James's letter might be, what does it look like to have faith? His is a theology to be lived out, not laid out. From the very first lines of the letter, we find James acknowledging the difficulties that these people faced. He writes, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, Jesus, too, confronts the conflicted state of the world and presumes a struggle for his followers. He says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. What's after that? I have overcome the world. <laughs> James says, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. But James is by no means unaware of the temptations and brokenness we all experience along the way on our journey toward maturity and completion in Christ. His letter offers a mirror which, if we care to see it, reveals the fragmented and fractured state of our souls and just how often and how easy it is to lose sight of God's purposes and will for us to veer away from the ways of wisdom, especially when living volatile and dangerous days. How much more for a group of people whose very lives are under constant threat for their belief in Jesus' word? So what does James have to, t have to say to us today? One commentator describes the book of James as a beautifully crafted punch in the gut for anyone, for those who want to follow Jesus. James's goal is not to new theological information, but rather to get in your business and challenge how you live. So what does it mean to be a doer of the word in the midst of a broken world in which we ourselves are fragmented and imperfect and so often lose sight of what truly matters, chasing off after false hopes, the dust and ashes of passing pleasures 
the allure of wealth in its fading glory. From the context of the passage, we may understand that to be a doer of the word has something to do with constancy. With God, there is no variation or shadow due to change, James declares. Those lights which constantly shift and change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth. God has a purpose for your life and is a constant light for you to go to in trust to fulfill that purpose. What a wonderful thought with awesome implications. You don't have to figure everything out. And as you rest in the constancy of God who gives generously to those who ask, to all who set their heart, mind, soul, and strength to know, love, and trust him, you also display a quality of constancy that can only come from God. God has given you birth by the word of truth. To be born by this word is to rest in the assurance that God is for you and not against you. The trials of this life may press in from all sides, and every manner of adversity may test your resolve, but your rejoicing is that of one who knows with all that you have and are that God is always faithful. God is always good. The word which saves is the knowledge that in Christ you have already received every perfect gift from God above. Return to that truth many, many times a day. Let it penetrate your heart, permeate your mind. You are loved. You must understand this, my beloved, says James. You are beloved of God. And right after that, he declares, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. This passage, to me again of God's constancy. It seems to me that so much of our discourse in today's world involves being quick to speak, having the snappy comeback, or if the other person is speaking, being skilled at quickly formulating a reply to show why I am right and you are wrong. Why? Could it have something to do with safety? If I can prove that I have the chops to declare my thoughts, then I am worth having around. I can find acceptance. In school, I'll get the grade for participation. At work, I might just receive the promotion. It's interesting that James introduces anger at this point, since isn't it often in those angry moments that we are least inclined to abide by these teachings and keep a rein on our tongues? Being quick to listen is a powerful act of trust. My salvation in God is secure. So I know I do not need to assert my will over this other person or people with whom I am speaking. Actions speak louder than words, it seems James is saying here. And the simple act of listening speaks volumes about God's patience. God's kindness, friendship, and grace. There is a saving word that has been planted in me, so I have no need to tear you down to feel safe myself. Now that says something as compared to today's general quality of discourse, political and otherwise. James writes, Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. Here is where the image of our last house in Southbridge comes to mind, and the overgrown tangle of angry briars and thorns. And welcome with meekness 
the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. Welcome with meekness. To be welcoming, to welcome is to be open. Meekness speaks of humility. One definition of meekness is that of strength under control. To be meek is to trust that God is powerful to save, so I need not fear. Humbly welcome the unsullied word of forgiveness and grace that God has offered to you through the passionate witness of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be a doer of the word first is to know the word, to be intimately acquainted with the word. James writes that it is the word which has the power to save our souls, and that it is an implanted word, an engrafted word. Angry briars and thorns, the tangle of sumac trees, speaks to me of rank growth and wickedness and that work that we carried out to tear it down to drag it to the backyard and burn it is somewhat like the practice the inner work that we're called to do to recognize those ways that we've allowed that tangle to flourish in our hearts. To tear it out, bring it to the backyard and have a bonfire. And the, the word that we welcome, the new birth in Christ, a picture of that seedling. It's tender, new growth that must be constantly tended, that must be constant, constantly watered, that must be cared for, that must be recalled continually throughout the day. I recall also Jesus's parable of the sower, the, seed, the different soils. To the one who perseveres in faith, to the one who continually abides in that trust, there is a harvest. But that word must be preserved in all meekness and humility and trust. I am beloved of God. You are beloved of God. Rest in that implanted word with all meekness and humility. And let your life constancy of Christ. Be a doer of the word. Amen.
Come, Holy Spirit of God, and search our hearts with the light of Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is the one God. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Come, let us return to the Lord and say, Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us. Bind up our wounds and revive us. Deliver us from judgment in Jesus Christ our Lord. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Let us share in the peace of Christ. Let us pray. Father God, as we offer gifts and tithes, we give you thanks for your generosity of spirit, for your integrity of being, for the wholeness that you are and bring. Let us live out that wholeness, your wholeness, with every step, with every word, with every pause to listen. Exalted among us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully, that you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever, Go in peace to love and serve in Jesus' name. Amen.